Uh, gear pins are uh, checked on board, override free files checked and so uh, receiving checklist is completed, sir. All right. Let's do a four star push. All right. I bet every pilot's wanted to do this. Here comes, sorry, right, engine number two. Uh, gonna go to run here. Gonna go to start for two seconds. Gonna start our time. There we go. Good, That's we got like. uh, N2, N2 percentage. All right. Hey, even if you don't want to fly a jet for a career, it would be nice to start a jet at least once and maybe push the throttle up. Jet engines are usually a lot easier to start than a prop, and the process is pretty simple. It comes down to lots of air under pressure, some fuel, and boom, you're lit. The tough part is getting enough compressed air. To understand how a turbine engine starts, you should understand how it works. They run off a suck, squeeze, burn, blow principle. Take this generic turbofan engine, like the one that powers the ERJ. It sucks air through the intake, and then it sends the air through a fan, compressing it. In the ERJ, the fan is a single stage, one row of blades. Then, most of the air goes around the engine. This is called bypass air. We use this for most of the engine's thrust and for cooling. The rest of the air goes through the hot section, the part of the engine that burns. Air traveling through the hot section gets compressed even further by passing through 14 rows or stages of compressor blades. At the end of the compressor section, the highly compressed air, which by now is extremely hot from all of that compression, passes into a diffuser where it slows down and stabilizes. Then it moves into the combustion chamber where it mixes with fuel and that's where it burns. Normally, the fuel-air mixture in a jet engine burns constantly, unlike in a reciprocating engine. Some people call this the bang section, but I like burn better because it makes it easier to understand that the fuel-air mixture is always burning. It's not a series of individual explosions. When the fuel burns, the air heats up, but this time it can expand and it's forced out through the turbine blades. In the ERJ, there's five rows called stages. The first two are called high-pressure turbines, and the last three are called the low-pressure turbines. The passing air spins the turbines, and that drives a shaft connected to the fan of the compressor blades, spinning them. And then after passing through the turbines, the hot air leaves the engine, generating a little more thrust. So, air passing through the combustion chamber needs to be highly compressed to handle all of the fuel that mixes in. If you can't get enough compressed air, you can't burn enough fuel, and the turbine's not going to light. So, to start a turbofan engine, you need to spin the compressor fast enough to start pushing compressed air into the diffuser and then into the combustion chamber. Simple, right? Not so. Jet engines have spark plug-like igniters that initially light the fuel-air mixture, and they keep it lit in turbulent or wet conditions. During a start sequence, the engine core needs to spin at 14% of its maximum speed before the igniters begin to light. The engine's core speed is called N2, and it's expressed as a percentage of maximum RPM. On the ERJ, 100% of N2 is roughly 16,000 RPM. So the engine needs to reach 2,200 RPM before the igniters start firing. So you're not going to hand prop that. And then the core needs to spin up to 28.5% of N2, over 4,500 RPM, before the engine can introduce the fuel and light the mixture. And when it adds fuel, it does so at about 200 pounds per hour. That's roughly half a gallon each minute. So you need a lot of compressed air coming into the combustion chamber to handle all of that fuel. Smaller turbines, like many turboprops, they're light enough to start using an electric battery and motor. But even a regional jet's engines are too large to start using that electric motor. So instead, we take a pressurized air and run it through an air turbine starter. That's another small turbine and it's attached to the side of the engine. The air spins the air turbine starter, which is connected to the engine shaft through a clutch. So spinning the air turbine starter in turn spins the engine's compressor. And you rely on that system until the engine reaches 28.5% of N2 and it lights. Then the engine powers itself. So where does the compressed air come from? Well, for most civilian turbines, it comes from one of three sources. The most common is the APU, or the auxiliary power unit. It's a small turbine engine, usually located near the tail, that provides compressed air and electricity. It powers the aircraft's electrical systems on the ground, it supplements compressed air and electricity while flying, and it acts as an all-around backup for electrical and pneumatic needs. And it can send compressed air to both of the engine's air turbine starters. It's small enough to start with a battery. So, when you normally start the jet, you first start the APU. Simple enough. But what happens if it's broken? Now, this happens a little bit more often than you'd actually think. 
In that case, you'll need an external source of compressed air. And the most common is the hover cart. It's an air compressor that hooks up to the side of an aircraft and it provides compressed air for engine starting. It's officially called an air start unit, but no one really calls it that. So this is an external start. Ready? All right, go ahead and uh, start number two. All right. Here comes, all right, engine number two. Uh, gonna go to run here. Gonna go to start for two seconds. Gonna start our time. There we go. Good, we got like. uh, into a percentage. All right, ignition starts at about 17% roughly. Should get it up to about 28% and we'll see a fuel flow and uh, light off. Fuel flow, light off. And our N1, which is the big blade up in the front, starting to spin at about 7.5% now. Now you're going to hear a bunch of clicking at about 56.4% N2, and that'll be all of our buses popping out of the generators. That looks good. Good. And now that engine two is up, we need to start engine one. But we don't need the cart anymore. We can actually use engine two for that. Turbine engines bleed off bypass air for aircraft systems, like the heated DI systems and the cabin pressurization system. And we can route compressed air from engine two to the air turbine starter on engine one. We simply open the bleeds on engine two, open the cross feed to engine one, and voila, engine one's ready to start, like this. Okay, now uh, to start uh, engine number one uh, from the bleed air from engine number two. Yep, we uh, will run up number two up to roughly 83% N2. That provides enough pressure from the 14 stage bleed valve to push through our system. We have the cross bleeds open, so the piping between the number two and number one is completely open. So when that pressure comes through, it's going to go through the system and actually going to spin uh, our number one engine up to 56.4, where it becomes self sustaining. All right, number two is coming up. Okay, and here we go. All right, go ahead. All right, 83%. Engine number one, uh, moving the start stop selector to the run position momentarily. Start for two seconds. We're going to start our time. And we're starting to see the uh, N2 rotation on engine number one. Ignition A is on. There's light off. Fuel flow. There goes N1. So n one starting to spin up just nice. We have a time limit of one one minute, and that's a limit uh, on the air turbine start of the ATS. Uh, it gets incredibly hot. That air that we're taking off the uh, 14 stage, believe it, is really hot. And so it's a structural limitation on the air turbine starter inside the engine. That's fine. That is associated with the number one running. So we get a main. Uh, we have a. We get a master warning if we have a main any main sa service door or main cabin door open with number one running. Uh, that's because that's where uh, passengers, if they're going to disembark the airplane, they'll go off the uh, main cabin door. And obviously, with number one running, that is a that is definitely a hazard in the 121 environment. Absolutely. So good. Got a good stabilized engine. We'll bring the power back down. So now we have two perfectly good idling engines. Once you get the engine started, you need to check a couple of indications quickly, unless you want to burn up the engine's core. But we'll show that in our next video.